The promise of sugar substitutes is that you get to enjoy incredible sweetness without any of the unwanted side effects associated with excess sugar. In other words, you literally get to have your cake and eat it too. But is this really true? Sort of, and we'll talk more about that later. But the starting argument that I'll make is this. If you have Hashimoto's thyroiditis and you ever have the choice between using an artificial sweetener or a natural sweetener, always opt for the natural version. The reason is simple. Unlike their artificial counterparts, they are not associated with an increased risk of Hashimoto's, an increased risk of diabetes, an increased risk of weight gain, and changes to taste perception. This makes them the clear winner if you have Hashimoto's, but not necessarily the best option for weight loss. But hold that thought for just a minute because we will come back to it. If you are simply looking for alternatives to processed sugar and artificial sweeteners, then here are the best ones. First is monk fruit. Monk fruit is a natural sweetener that is derived from the monk fruit tree and is about 250 times sweeter than table sugar. Compared to sugar, it contains zero calories. Next is allulose. Allulose is considered by many to be the go-to sugar replacement right now given its low calorie content and sweetness profile that is very similar to table sugar. Compared to sugar, allulose contains 90% fewer calories. Next is stevia, which is approximately 200 to 300 times sweeter than sugar, making it the sweetest on this entire list. Stevia extracts are usually available as Rev-A, and these are also considered zero calorie. And the next group are the sugar alcohols. These are extracted from fruits and vegetables, making them a natural source, and include things like erythritol, mannitol, and xylitol. Compared to sugar, they are about 60 to 100% as sweet, but vary depending on which one you're actually looking at. In terms of calories, xylitol contains 2.4 calories per gram, which is about 60% of that of table sugar, and erythritol, on the other hand, contains zero calories. So which one is best and which one should you use if you have Hashimoto's? My opinion is that it doesn't really matter, and the reason is that if you are asking this question, you're probably thinking about it all wrong. Here's why. The first reason is that every single one of these is heavily processed. And when you look at the data, it's clear processed foods should always be avoided. And even though you should never consider these substitutes as food, it's clear that they still undergo a lot of processing. Allulose, for instance, is made by breaking down cornstarch and other plant sugars by specific enzymes. And these enzymes, at least as far as I can tell, come from a genetically modified E. coli strain. Stevia is created through a seven-step process, which includes things like liquid extraction, purification, and crystallization. And xylitol is created through a five-step process, which includes hydrogenation. I'm not trying to suggest that just because these are all heavily processed that they are automatically bad, but generally speaking, the more processed something is, the worse it is for your body. And I have a hard time accepting that compounds that undergo this degree of processing are somehow good for the body, given that we know processed foods are so bad for the body. Second is that they are not considered food. At their core, these compounds are really just there to enhance the flavor of food. But there's no real reason to consume them. And I would argue there's no real benefit to using them either. And anyone who is trying to suggest that they are beneficial is falling into the mindset that they are somehow medicinal as opposed to supplemental. For instance, even though there's some data to show that allulose may help with weight gain, diabetes, and high blood sugar, are you really going to start taking allulose as a supplement to treat these conditions? And if not, are you really trying to suggest that swapping out sugar for allulose in your homemade brownies is somehow going to treat your diabetes? Doesn't it just make a lot more sense to not eat those brownies if you're trying to fix that problem? I think so, which is why the idea of using these substitutes as a way to continue to make unhealthy choices just doesn't make a lot of sense. The third is that they come with their own set of side effects. While these alternatives definitely have far fewer side effects compared to their artificial counterparts, they are not completely side effect free. Fortunately, their biggest downside seems to be their impact on the gut, where they commonly cause symptoms like gas, bloating, or diarrhea. Right now, it doesn't appear that these natural versions negatively impact the gut microbiome like their artificial counterparts, but it seems hard to believe that they can cause GI distress without at least impacting that gut microbiome by some degree. But this side effect is not as concerning as the fact that they may alter your perception to taste. And it's this that may impact the thing I want to talk about next. And that is the fourth, they probably aren't the miracle weight loss treatment you think they are. Let's be honest for a minute here. 
The real reason that you, or anyone else for that matter, wants to use these substitutes is because you like the idea of being able to eat something sweet at a lower cost of calories. And because they are natural, you probably feel a little bit better about yourself by making that choice compared to eating something artificial. If this is true, then theoretically, eating more of these substitutes would allow you to lose weight without changing your lifestyle to a significant degree. The problem is it just doesn't work that way. It definitely doesn't work that way with the artificial sweeteners as I already showed you. The more of those that you consume, the more likely you are to be overweight. But what does the research show for natural options like stevia? One study looked at this very thing and here's what they found. In a randomized controlled setting, the use of stevia for 12 weeks did not result in any impact on weight, insulin, or blood sugar compared to placebo. They did find, however, that those people who were taking stevia did not gain weight, unlike those people who weren't taking it. So maybe at best we can say that stevia at least doesn't promote weight gain, but it's not a weight loss treatment, at least not an effective one. And I think the reason for this is simple. People that lose weight and keep it off have one thing in common. They find a way to change their lifestyle and they stick to it. The problem with most of these sugar substitutes is that their use continues to promote unhealthy choices, at least for most people. This is why people who swap out full sugar soda for diet soda don't really see any benefits to their health. The real issue is the fact that they're drinking soda, not whatever it's being sweetened with. And there's even some evidence to suggest that these sugar substitutes may make losing weight more difficult by virtue of how they impact your preference for sweetness. The more sweet things that come into contact with your tongue, the more you want them. So in a very real sense, you may be self-sabotaging your weight loss efforts right now by trading a small reduction in calories for an increase in sugar cravings later down the road. Who do you think is going to win? Your willpower or your biologically driven food cravings? We already know how this story plays out and willpower does not win. And in my opinion, this is probably the main reason that none of these sugar alternatives really help people lose weight. So what should you use? The best way to think about this is in terms of priority. No matter what, the artificial sweeteners like Splenda and Aspartame should always be avoided. There's really just no good reason to ever consume these. Likewise, there's really no good reason to consume processed and refined sugars like table sugar or brown sugar either. There's plenty of evidence to prove that these cause problems. The real question is whether or not you should use natural low calorie sweeteners like stevia or allulose instead of whole food sweeteners like honey or maple syrup. And here's where I'm going to buck the trend and suggest that honey and maple syrup are superior for thyroid patients. Not only are these options considered whole foods, unlike even the natural ones we discussed, they are minimally processed, they contain plenty of beneficial bioactive compounds, and they don't trigger those sugar cravings like the substitutes do. Most important of all is the fact that adding these to your diet will probably result in a change to your lifestyle, which is great. Is there a place for these natural alternatives if you have Hashimoto's? I would say sure, a little bit here or there in moderation isn't going to cause a big deal. The best use case is to swap out these natural options wherever you would have used processed or refined sugar otherwise. That might be things like adding it to your oatmeal or maybe your coffee. As far as which one you use, that one is more of a personal preference. They are all pretty much equal so long as you're using a low dose. If you do decide to use them, I would think of them as something that's more akin to a treat or something that you only use occasionally. Don't think of them as a way that allows you to continue to make unhealthy food choices just with fewer calories. An example of this would be eating sugar-free ice cream every single night. If your main goal is to lose weight, then what you really want to do is change your lifestyle. Cut out all sources of artificial and natural sweeteners, and just eat real whole foods like fruit and fruit juices as your sole source of sweetness. Not only are these much healthier options, they can also improve your thyroid. And if you want to learn which fruits and fruit juices are best for your thyroid, then I'd recommend checking out this video next.